folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of prophetic research ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. Those of you who have watched this broadcast have watched um, some of the teachings, the preachings that I've done over the years, have read some of the books that we have put out. You know that I love symbols. I like to study uh, occult symbols. When I see something strange or some sort of symbol, I want to know what that is, and my eye is always looking for something. It, it all goes to the first time that I saw this tricatcher on the front of a New King James Bible, and I'm asking myself, what is that? Why is that there? I've never seen that before. That's strange to me. What does this symbol represent? I wanted to know. I wanted to know secrets because that's what symbols represent. They represent something that if you really want to find out, you're going to have to, as Paul told us, you're going to have to study to show yourself approved unto God. And so I like to study the occult symbols. I like to, I want to know what they're hiding. I want to know what sneaky plan they have in operation and that they're hiding behind a symbol. And that's how the occult uses symbols and they never get this now. I want you to understand this in the occult realm. When they use a symbol, they're very, very particular to never actually write down what that symbol means, because if somebody wrote it down, then somebody's going to read it and they're not going to know what that means. And the whole idea of occult symbolism has everything to do with the spirit of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Everything about her spirit and about her religion is a mystery. The book of Proverbs in describing her, calling her the strange woman, the book of Proverbs tells us that her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. And so when you see a symbol on, on a book or in a movie or on a bottle of shampoo, I've got a symbol on my shampoo bottle at home. Uh, when you see one of those and you get an explanation from somebody of what that symbol might mean, they're probably not telling you the truth. And so one of the things that I've discovered in reading a lot of occult literature like morals and dogma and different things like that, they will never actually come out and tell you what it really, really means. But then we get into Bible symbols. Symbols in the Bible are like parables. They are a way of God speaking that to those who don't want to know, it, they're not going to know. Uh, Mark chapter 4, we might go there in a minute. Uh, but anyway, to those who really do want to know, God actually wrote the meaning of the symbol down. I, I usually uh, refer to symbolism like I do Bible typology. The Study the stories that are in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Read the Gospels. That is a storyline of the events of Jesus Christ uh, and His life and His ministry. And one of the symbols that we're going to study today uh, concerning Jesus Christ is the symbol of the crown of thorns. That, that's always fascinated me. In last week's Watchman broadcast, I was going to deal with that, uh, but the Lord said no. And so when I went to research uh, for this Watchman video broadcast, the Lord just sort of brought it to my mind. Let's, let's study these symbols. Let's study the crown of thorns. Let's see what actually is going on and what the Bible reveals. I mentioned earlier that it has a lot to do with Bible typology. And, and I explained that. We actually have a video that teaches the language of typology in the Scriptures. But let me, let me go back on some of these Scriptures and understand what symbolism is all about and how God speaks through biblical symbols, how He explains those symbols, and how He uses them to reveal to those who want to know the truth things that are coming in the last days. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, here's what God said. He said, I have also spoken by the prophets. We know that. I have multiplied visions. And then notice what he says, and have used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. That word similitude has the word similar in it, which means that this is going to be as that. Now, I've explained this before, but I, I want you to, as you're reading the King James Bible, look for a particular word in the Bible. It's one of, it's actually one of the shortest words in English, one of the shortest words in the Bible. You'll see it everywhere in the scriptures, and yet it tends to be one of the most profound words in the scripture. It's the word as, as. 
This is as that. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of the Man. And so here we have Noah, whose life and his story is a, is a prophecy, because God said that he used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And so we study the, the days of Noah. Look at the chronology of Noah given to us in the scripture. Look at the life of Noah. Look at the things that were acted out. Study the ark. Study the animals that were going in there. Study um, the, the meaning behind the words of the scripture, such as the word generations, which just happens to have the word gene in it. And I want you to think about that. But study those things because God is using them to be typological or prophetic examples teaching us that as it was in these days, so shall it be in the future days. Solomon is the one who wrote in Ecclesiastes 1, he said, there's, there's really no new thing under the sun. That which has, has already taken place, what's already been of old time, will happen again. And we talk about this in our video called The Cycles of Christian Growth. But he says he used similitudes, things that are similar to this. This is as that. And so pay attention when you're studying the scriptures, when you see something. And we, we actually, I'm going to point out later on the use of this word as in relation to what Jesus had on his head the day that he was crucified. Colossians chapter 2, let's, let's go there. The Bible uses different words to talk about symbolism and typology. It uses the word similitudes. He used here in the book of Colossians, he says in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Anybody that has studied uh, literature... Uh, will tell you that a lot of lot of writers, short story writers or novel writers or whatever, they like to use a, a technique in their writing called foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. In other words, it almost it's almost like you um, you look and you get a glimpse of the end of the story by looking at the beginning of the story or something that is compelling or interesting at the beginning of the story, you look at the shadow of someone and then you see a sort of an unclear image of the reality of that person. And that's what, that's what foreshadowing is. And the Bible uses this kind of language here to describe for you the things like the tabernacle. Go study the tabernacle. We're going to talk about the tabernacle a little bit today and what it was made of. Very, very interesting things. The tabernacle, the temple, go study the ark, go study the, the stories that are given to us in the scriptures. They are a shadow of things to come. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4, look at what the Bible says here. For if he were on the earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the, notice the two words here, example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount <clears throat> so the bible is telling you that Moses even Moses himself the things that Moses said, the things that Moses did. Why did, he, why did he have to go up to a mountain to get the Ten Commandments? Why were there ten? Why were they written on stone? Why were they written on both sides? Why did he come down from the mountain and break the tablets and then have to go back? Why did he carve out tablets before he went back up to the mountain and then come down again? Why was his face shining as the sun? Why did they have to put a veil over his face? All of these things about Moses, when I study these things, I'm just absolutely blown away by the symbolism of the Bible, by the typology of the Bible, and by the language structure of the Bible that tells you why this or how this is as that. And so we study Moses, we study the priesthood, we study the tabernacle, we study all of these things to get an understanding of what lies ahead. If you uh, go into the occult world, the occult world will say, 
Oh, I want to look at your palm. And they look at your palm. Oh, you have this line here and this means this. And oh, I can see that based upon your hand, this and that and the other. <clears throat> that That's just a... That's just a gimmick. That's a farce. That's not real. Or the leaves in the bottom of a of a glass or a cup of tea. Oh, look at the shapes there. Or or tarot cards. So I'm going to lay out cards, and that's going to determine your future. What a terrible way to live life. What a terrible way to a, a terrible way to view the future. That it's all based upon the random arrangement of cards, lines on your hand, tea leaves gazing into a crystal ball when the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy right here in the King James Bible for us. And we can actually, if we study, we study the prophecies, what Jeremiah said, what Isaiah said. We study the typology. We study the language of the Scriptures. God gives us understanding of what happens in the last days. He does so by, by showing us things that have happened, that they are an example and a shadow of things to come. And let me let me take again this opportunity to throw this in here. I believe in the literalness of the Scripture. I believe in its total accuracy. I believe it is completely and 100% infallible in everything and in every detail that it speaks in. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Because I believe in prophecy. I believe that the Bible declares the end of this world. It declares the end of my life. It declares the end of all the kingdoms of this earth. And it declares what is going to happen in future days. If we cannot trust the Bible to be reliable about its record of the past, how can we trust it to be reliable about what it says concerning the future? See, that just kind of makes sense to me. So I believe that the earth was created... And God did all of his work in six literal days. And even the Bible says in the evening and the morning were the first day. It's actually telling you how long those days were. So I believe in it. I believe Joshua marched around Jericho 13 times. I believe the walls fell. You know, the archaeologists say, oh, there was no Jericho. That was, that was just some story. I believe that Jonah, I believe that Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. Jesus said, Listen, listen to what he said. For as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And so if Jonah was, and, and the scientists, the scientists, the smart people with laboratory coats and smoking pipes and turtlenecks, they all say, now we know that there's no such thing as a whale that could swallow a, a human being and there's no way this and that and the other. Well, that's, that's what they say. I just know that God said that he prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. That's exactly what I believe. I believe that he was in there three days and three nights. And that is an example to us of how the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So I believe in the literal interpretation, the literal reading. I believe that if the Bible says it, that's how it was. And that's very, very important to remember. In Galatians chapter 4, the Bible uses the word allegory. The Bible says uh, in verse 24, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and entereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Notice the Bible is telling you about, uh, about people that are representative of things that are coming. Notice the Bible is telling you about a mountain, Mount Sinai, um, that, that is symbolic of, a, of an idea or a concept that God is wanting to teach you. So this word allegory, this word example, this word ex, um, a shadow, the word similitude. We have another word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And I, and I want you to, let's, let's, let's learn a little bit of English here. You know, everybody says, all the scholars say, well, you need to learn Hebrew and Greek in order to understand the Bible. I'm not done with English yet. I'm still studying English. And this word in samples has the word sample in it. You know what a sample is, don't you? When you go to, uh, when you go to, when you go to Walmart or you go to Sam's Club or you go to one of them big, 
those great big uh, warehouse stores, there's always somebody there with an apron and they got a little uh, oven there and they're always making these little things that are in the freezer section or whatever. And they're, they're giving you a little cup or a little plate with a, with a, um, just a portion of, of the entire package that you get. And they call it samples. And, and I love to go and, and get Free samples. When you go to the, the food court of the mall, I love the food court. When you go to the food court of the mall, there's always people standing there with little things on toothpicks or in little cups. Would you like a free sample? Yes. And my wife goes to look at clothes. Me and the boys, we go to the food court and just get samples, one thing after another. You see that word in sample has the word sample in it. It's just a small piece of a much bigger thing. He says, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so the Bible's telling us, study the stories, study the people, study the mountains, study the rocks, study the tablets, study the hand, study, study uh, the names, study the numbers, the location, study all of these things because they mean something. God says, I'm going to teach my people something. And, and I know I speak in parables. I utter dark sayings of old. But if you remember Jesus, in fact, let's do this. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to Mark chapter 4. Because here we have a, a, a parable with word symbols in it, word pictures in it. Mark chapter 4. The Bible says, and he began in verse 1, the Bible says, and he began to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and he said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. He's, he's trying to get you to picture See, we, we have two parts of our brain. I love this. We have, we have the logical side that reads words and is, is everything is black and white. We have the creative side that draws a picture for us. And God is using both of these. One is helping the other, just like a wife is to help her husband. One is helping the other so that we can, we can sort of see in our mind what's going on. And he's drawing a picture for you, a sower who sows the seed. And so we understand if you've read this story before, you know that this is very, very symbolic. It's, it's a parable. Um, in verse 4, it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, we're not going to study all of these symbols here, but the fowls of the air are a symbol of something. And the Bible is going to explain what they are a symbol of. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, verse 5, some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him uh, with the twelve asked him of the parable. They said, you know, what, what were you getting at? I mean, you were telling a story, but don't just leave us hanging here, Lord. I mean, tell us what it means. Now, if the Lord, as, as some accuse Jesus... There are some out there who say Jesus was, uh, he was very, very well educated in the mystery religions. He was, in fact, Dan Brown and others lead us to believe that Jesus was actually discipled by John the Baptist who was, who was like into the occult and he knew all these occult secrets. If that was the case, when they asked Jesus the meaning of the parable, he would have never told them. He would have never told them what it really meant. But I want you to notice this. Verse 11, he said unto them, unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. God wants us to know. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. You see, there are people who want to know. God will explain it to them through the pages of the Bible. There are people who don't want to know. God's not going to explain anything. 
Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they, they may hear and not understand, lest in any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? He asks the question, How will we know what parables mean? How can we discern how to understand symbols or types or things in the Bible? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what the scripture says. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, I want to stop right here. Let's again, let's contrast the occult realm with God's realm. In the occult realm, they tell you that if you really want to know some of these mysteries... You've got to earn it. You've got to work for it. You've got to climb the ladder. You have to perform the rituals. In masonry, they tell you that every ritual that you perform in masonry, we're going to give you another little dose of the secret. And so you get to the 32nd or the 33rd degree, we're going to spill the beans. That's not really true. By the time you become even a 33rd degree mason, you really don't know exactly what's going on with me. You don't know the secret. They won't tell it to you. And I, I would venture a guess as to say probably a huge majority of high-level Masons never understand the truth of what's behind it. It's all still a mystery to them. And yet in God's realm, these things, we, we don't earn them. We don't work for them. We don't climb the ladder. We don't go through rituals and initiations and levels and things like that. They are freely given to us of God. God just says, look at this, look at this, look at this. And he gives them to us for free. He doesn't ask us to get better. He doesn't ask us to be sinless. He doesn't ask us to be perfect. He doesn't ask us to do anything except just believe what he said. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So here, I want you to get this. Number one, that if we're going to understand things, symbols from the Bible, we need to stick with the Bible to get, an underst to get a true understanding. Now, once we get the true understanding from the Bible, we might look out in the world and we see things going on and we're going to say, this is that which was spoken in the scriptures, but we never use the things of the world to get our understanding. We use the scriptures. He says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, spiritual things out of the Old Testament and compare the spiritual things of the New Testament and let the Holy Ghost teach us these things. And so the Bible's telling us that if we're going to understand the crown of thorns, if we're going to understand what the ark is, if we're going to understand why Judas kissed Jesus, if we're going to understand, you know, and, and, and here's why I'm saying this. I hear, I've heard a lot of sermons. I listen to a lot of preachers. And, and I've heard a lot of preachers who will read something out of the Bible and they'll say something similar to this. Now, in ancient Palestine, this was a symbol of so-and-so-and-so-and-so. Or, in, back in Bible times, here's what they used to do. What they used to do is this. This, this was a common thing that people... They would, they would say that these, these words and phrases in the Bible really, really only meant something to the people that they were written to at the time. But really, for us to understand it, we would have to go back and you know, like, be like 3,000 years old in order... I, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that if I see something in the Scriptures and I don't understand what it means... I'm not going to go I'm not going to go to a history book. I'm not going to watch the Discovery Channel. I'm not going to go to a website. What I'm going to do is I'm going to study the scriptures to find out why God said what he said or what happened or why this was. I'm going to stick with the scriptures. Let's look at the crown of thorns. I love this symbolism of the crown of thorns. I like the, the journey that we're going to take in this teaching. Mark chapter 15, verse 17. Here's what the Bible says. 
And they clothed him with purple. Study colors in the Bible. And plaited. Look at the word plaited. That means, that word means something. Okay? Go look up these words that we, if, if, if you think that you know what it means, go look it up. Okay? They plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed. And you have to ask yourself, why did they do that? And did spit upon him and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And, and I want us to look at just uh, for a few minutes what the scriptures say about why it was a crown. Who does a crown belong to? Think about it. A crown goes on a, a, a prince or a king. What, what king are we dealing with here? Why was it... Th- I mean, just think of the, the, the natural thing of thorns. Ouch! They put that on Jesus' head. The pain, the, the sting that it has. Thorns are designed, were designed by God to do one thing. And that is pierce... And sting. So it requires a little bit of thought on our part. Looking at thorns, everybody knows thorns. We all know what a thorn is. Thorns are all over the world. And so God is drawing this picture for us as something that we are able to recognize. And, 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 and we think about what a thorn represents. And what does it mean? Why, why was it put upon his head? Why was it there? And so for our answers to understanding the crown of thorns, let's go to the scriptures. Let's go to actually the first place in the Bible that uses the word thorn or where thorns appear. We go back to Genesis chapter 3. As it as it was, as it was back then, so shall it be is what the Bible says. Now Genesis chapter 3. Let's let's stop for a minute and let's think about what happens here in Genesis chapter 3. Number 1, we have the temptation of Eve and then we have the sin of Eve and Adam. We have all kinds of symbols there. The fruit, uh, your eyes being opened. The, the fact that, 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 that Eve was looking at the tree and all three things that, that compel us to sin showed up. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I want you to think of these three things as we study this idea of thorns, because we're going to see it a little bit later. We're going to see it in the Scriptures. We're going to see it out of the Scriptures. So, number one, the lust of the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those things that the devil used to tempt Eve when she ate of the fruit and she gave to her husband, those things had consequences. And you know, I want you to think about this. Our sin always has consequences to it. There are always reactions to our actions. And God had actually warned. He had actually warned Adam what would happen in the day that he ate of the fruit. He said, ye shall surely die. And God's word was absolute. It cannot be broken. The devil told Eve something else that we'll look at a little bit later on. But here is, here is the consequences now of Adam's actions in hearkening to the voice of his wife and disobeying the direct commandment of the Lord. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed. <clears throat> Here's the reaction now. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And so right right, right away, we're seeing, we're getting an understanding here. Why did Jesus have a crown of thorns on his head? What, what What does the thorn symbolize? Well, according to Genesis chapter 3, the thorns symbolize a curse. God is telling Adam, Adam, you're going to go out and sow your seed. You're going to, you're going to plant fields. You're going to have to work, Adam, by the way. Uh, when you were in the garden, you had everything for free. Okay, you could eat whatever you... 
But now, Adam, because of sin, you have to work. And by the sweat of your face, you're going to work and you're going to labor. And you're going to eat bread in sorrow. You're going to hate your job. You're going to go to bed tired. All of these things that we experience right now is a curse because of man's sinfulness. And so he's telling Adam all these things. He said, you're going to sow your seed out in the field and here's what's going to happen. Instead of wheat coming up, instead of barley coming up, instead of you having a nice lawn, thorns are going to come up. And thorns are, they're not attractive. They're not good for anything. And boy, they sure hurt when we touch them. And so the the sting, I want you to think about things that sting in the Bible. We're going to see it again. And the Bible is actually going to say this is as... That in relation to things that sting. And he promised Adam that he would surely die. So I want you to kind of be thinking about where we're going here. Disobedience to God seems to be the theme that surrounds this idea of thorns. When God says, hey, I want it this way. I think we ought to do it this way. Uh, Follow my, my commandments and life will be great. When you disobey me. Um, it's not so pleasant. And so God told Israel that he, he freed them from Egypt. You know, that's, a, that's an in sample and a picture to us of where God freed us when God saved us. How, what did he save us from? Think about your Egypt. Think about the bondage that you used to be in when you were in Egypt, when you were lost. And now here is God and he frees you out of Egypt. He wants you to go into the promised land. And he says, now, when you get there, you need to you need to get rid of everybody. Everybody's got to go because my people are coming in. And, and I'm pretty particular about this. I want everybody out. Joshua, you when your armies go in, everybody's got to leave. They didn't do that. And here's what God promised to the Israelites, what would happen when they didn't get rid of everybody? And I want you to key in on this. Because when you got saved, you you probably made some promises to God. God, I'm not going to drink no more. I'm not going to smoke no more. I'm not going to say cuss words no more. I'm not going to chase women no more. God, I'm going to give up all my vices and I'm going to be good and I'm going to be clean and I'm going to be holy and I'm never going to do these things ever again. Well, that's what we promised. That's what God would like for us to do. Um, That's not what we did when we got saved. I I don't know of anybody that after they got saved, they just lived this perfect, spotless, sin-free, absolutely no blemish kind of life. I I don't know of anybody that has ever done that. Um, Let me show you what God said would happen when we didn't go and get rid of all the stuff. Okay, Numbers chapter 33, verse 55. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. I want you to think about that. In other words, you'll be living in the land and, you know, it'll be good. But you'll still have thorns in your side as a result of you not getting rid of everything that you should have got rid of when you first got right with God. The things that you promised God that you would never say, never look at, never do, never touch. Those things, it's kind of like being on a diet. It's like being on a diet. We go on a diet and we make a vow. I'm not going to eat pizza no more. No more Chinese food. No more chocolate. I'm not going to touch that thing. Okay. Diets last, you know, a while. We have good intentions. But then we go and we defile ourselves with the unclean pizza and the vile chocolate mousse and the bacon sandwich. We we do it. And it's a thorn in our flesh. Okay, it has consequences. And here is God. Now, I want you to notice now, disobedience to God equals thorns. Disobedience to what God said, it equals thorns. Thorns, thorns in your side, like splinters under your skin. They hurt and they fester and they cause problems. And this and, that, and, and, and nobody likes it. But this is what God said was going to happen. There would be, there would be thorns. Now, something you need to... Uh, you, we're we're going to move back to, over to the book of Mark here in a little bit. You need to understand something about these thorns. 
that if we're not careful, the thorns, though they may start out being few in number, they always sort of find a way to thrive and take over. Keep that in mind. He says in Joshua 23, the fulfillment of what he said in the book of Numbers, Joshua 23, verse 13, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. And notice this. Uh, and in fact, I want to stop right here. I want you, when we go back to this verse, I want you to look at the exact language of the King James Bible. And I want you to think of what we're studying, the crown of thorns. These nations shall be scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. Think about it. When they carried Jesus, when they took him to Golgotha, what, what, what did they do? They, they scourged him and they took these thorns and stuck it down over his head, probably sticking around his eyes. Think about what Christ did for you and what the symbolism of it is. Scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. So God meant it. God meant it. He told them, you go into the land, clean everything out, don't leave anything because if you do, it's going to be a thorn in your flesh. We use, we use that phrase now. Thorn, it's going to be a thorn in your flesh. They go into the land. They don't chase out all the inhabitants. They leave some of them there. And God said, I, I, I'm not going to drive them out. They are going to be thorns in your flesh. They're going to be thorns in your eyes. They're, they're going to be a problem for you the rest of your life. And you're going to have to deal with this. And I want you to think about your life in Christ right now. There are still some things that the truth of it is we left there when we got saved. And God says... They're going to be a thorn in your flesh the rest of your life. There's going to be something that you're going to have to deal with the rest of your life. Now, uh, this idea of disobedience, disrespect to God, uh, uh, having nothing to do with God. Uh, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 6. Here's what the Bible says. It actually, and actually, we're going to use this word as here. Now, there's an expression in the Bible. I, I love to study these things. This phrase, son of Belial, or sons of Belial, or children of Belial. <clears throat> I know who Belial is, okay? Uh, I, I've met him several times. Uh, Belial is, is the devil. And remember Jesus, excuse me, the Apostle Paul taught us that we should not have, in what fellowship hath Christ with Belial? And the answer is none. There's no fellowship between Christ and Belial, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, uh, the tempter, the deceiver of the brethren, the accuser of the brethren, the Bible calls him. Oh, he's our arch enemy. We hate his guts. Okay? Um, and he has a seed, by the way. Go back and read Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. He has offspring. And here we have the Bible referencing sons of Belial. And if you just study uh, the word Belial in the Scriptures, you'll understand that those who are of his offspring, number one, they're murderous. Number two, they're rebellious against God. Number three, they hate God's people. They hate the Bible. They hate everything about it. They're drunkards. They're murderers. Um, they're to be cast into the lake of fire one of these days. That's what you'll get when you study the word Belial and the sons of Belial. But I want you to notice 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 6. The Bible says, but the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. Now, I want you to, I want you to concentrate on this now. Here we have the symbolism of thorns. And we have another uh, uh, symbolist, uh, symbolic idea. That is the children or the sons or the offspring of Belial. Acts chapter 13, there was a guy actually called thou child of the devil. Okay? And so here we have, uh, uh, number one, we can see this as uh, those who have been like, like Cain, who the Bible says was of that wicked one. We have people all around us, all around us that are wicked, that are vile, that uh, disobey God, that hate church, that hate the Bible, that hate all these things. And I can tell you from a practical standpoint that when you get saved and get right with God, the best thing for you to do in life is to lose some of your friends. 
And I'll tell you this, if you're intent on living for God, you won't have to chase your friends away. They'll leave. But see, here's what happens when we start getting in with the earthly affiliations and the earthly contacts and maintaining the earthly friendships is that if we're trying to live for the Lord, here's, here's people around us that are nothing but thorns. The children of Belial are as thorns thrust away. Here's that word as. They are as thorns thrust away. And they do and will continue to have an influence. I want you to think about uh, media, television, movies, uh, um, uh, TV shows, books, magazines, comic books, even video games produced by people who are probably just children of Belial. And their influence into the church is massive. And it's like thorns. And I want you to understand that we need to be careful about the, all the thorns that we keep building up in our life because something bad, something bad is going to happen with all of these thorns. And I'll, and I'll show you as we move along. There is one particular identity in the Scriptures that thorns represent. We're already getting an idea Children of Belial, literally the offspring of Satan. Now, when we go back to Genesis chapter 3, we see the two bloodlines. We see the seed of the serpent. We see the seed of the woman. Now, I want you to just kind of think about this as we move forward. We know that the seed of the woman, we know that it's epitomized or uh, comes to fruition in the man, Jesus Christ. He is the seed of the woman. Who then would epitomize or be the fruition or the fulfillment of the seed of the serpent, the child or the son of Belial, the child of the devil? Think, think about that and think about how thorns relate to There's actually a movie made about this. You're going to like this here in a little bit. Second Chronicles chapter 33, the Bible says this, And the Lord spake to Manasseh, and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought them upon them, the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Manasseh is a perfect example. Manasseh is a king that lived uh, right, right before the time the, the Israelites or the, those of Judah went into Babylonian captivity. Interesting thing is, the Bible says Manasseh reigned 55 years. Did you know the word Satan, the exact word Satan in the King James Bible is mentioned exactly 55 times? Did you know that the word devils is mentioned exactly 55 times in the King James Bible? There's kind of a match here. This number five, you ever seen a pentagram? We're going to show you that in a minute. Okay, but here's what happened. Uh, Manasseh and the people of Israel, the people of Judah, were warned. They were preached to. They were told, hey, you need, to, you need to get right with God. And they didn't listen. They kept in their pagan practices. And finally, God let the thorns take over the children of Belial and carried them into Babylonian captivity. I want you to think about it. The thorns representing the wickedness of this world that just takes over. Okay? Think about it. Uh, Psalm chapter 118. Here's what the, the, this is where we this is where it starts to really get interesting for me because I re remember Adam sinned. He disobeyed God. He 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 now has a, a curse upon him. He God had warned him that it would be the curse of death, and then he throws in this idea of thorns coming up and thorns sting. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter 118. All nations can pass me about. Now, let me stop here. Once again, we're seeing a, a, a picture of, of God's man, or let's say God's family, or God's church, or God's denomination, or God, wh whatever, God's ministry. We're seeing a representation of that. And have you, have you ever wondered why or how... Let's say that you've been going to church all your life. I have. I remember people that I, as a child, I sat, I sat next to in church that right now they will never, ever darken the door of another church as long as they live. They're not coming back, and I'm not their judge. I'm just saying they, are, they, they hate church pretty bad right now. There's some kids that I grew up here, you just don't see in church. Did you ever wonder what happened to them? Did you ever wonder what happened, happens to the old preachers? That used to preach it. I mean, they used to just preach the Bible, preach the old King James in the old time way. And something happened. 
And all of a sudden, they got the changed. A change took place, and think, they're not pre. They're preaching things that you're going. Where did that come from? Churches, ministries, denominations. How is it that they that they turn bad? The Bible is trying to give us this example uh, with thorns. Notice again, Psalm 118, verse 10. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They can pass me about. In other words, they were all around me. Yet they can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in them, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Now, what, what, do, what do bees and what do thorns have in common? Now, let, let's, let's think about this for a minute, okay? A bee is this big. A thorn, and I've seen some pretty long thorns, but a thorn is this big, okay? Now, I am this big, and yet, if I'm, if I'm walking, uh, you know, like in the woods, uh, if I'm going out to my deer stand, and I happen to come across a tree that is just loaded with thorns, did you know that I'll walk a big circle around that thing? I won't, I won't get anywhere near it. I don't like uh, I, I don't like bees very much. Okay, and, and they're this big. But what's the what's the similitude, the similarity between bees and thorns? They sting. Both of them have a sting, and I want you to think about that. By the way, there there just happens to be another similarity between bees. And thorns. I'm going to show you a graphic. This is uh, a typical of a Masonic lambskin apron. Masons have a lot of strange symbols on their aprons, on their clothing, on their bumper sticker, on their ring, on their Bibles, in their lodges. They have lots of strange symbolism. And did you know they'll never tell you the truth about what those... Most of them don't even know the truth of what they mean. They'll never, they'll never reveal what these symbols really mean. I, I, I like the Bible because the Bible actually tells you what they all mean. Uh, but anyway, I want you to notice something. That number one, we, we zoom in here and we see a, a beehive and bees flying around it. Okay. Remember, they have a sting. And then we have, it looks like laurel there at the bottom of the, uh, of the square. But it's actually, and the, the Masons use this word because it's all their literature. Albert Pike talks about it. Manley Hall talks about it. Albert Mackey refers to it in his uh, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry uh, terms. They call it, they don't call it thorns. They call it acacia. Now, I just came from Kenya, and I can tell you there's acacia trees everywhere. And you know what they are? They're thorn trees. That's what acacia is. So when you hear a Masonic lecture, when you hear a teaching about Freemasonry, or you're reading something, uh, of a, or you see a Masonic emblem, and it's, a, and it's a sprig of acacia, and there's a reason why they use it. When you see that, I, I want you to know that what that really is, is a thorn tree. So the Masonic emblem of thorns and bees, they all point towards something because they both sting. They, they both point towards something and they both sting. And that's very, very important to remember because Freemasonry tells you that if you just follow Masonry, you will have rejuvenation or revival or you will be resurrected somehow, some way. That's, that's not true, and I'll show you why it's not true here in a little bit. Proverbs chapter 24. Notice this. I, the, the teaching here is, is absolutely tremendous. Um, remember, a, a man, a family, a church, a ministry, um, a, a denomination, or, or whatever it is, that uh, started out, I mean, wanting to serve the Lord. Um, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you the branches, and so we are the vineyard of the Lord. Okay, And I want you to notice the proverb that was given to a Solomon who sees this with his own eyes. And he says in Proverbs 24, he says, I went by the field of the slothful. And I will tell you this. I don't believe in work salvation for a second. I believe we're saved by grace. But I will tell you that I labor quite a bit 
I labor quite a bit in the Lord just to keep sin, sinfulness, and every, just to keep the thorns down. You ever planted a garden? You ever had you ever had like a flower garden or a vegetable garden or anything like that? You can't just throw the seed out there and say, "Ah, knock yourself out. I'll be back in a three months to go pick it." I can tell you it takes work because if you don't work that garden, you don't work that flower garden, you don't you don't work that thing. Some bad things are going to take over real fast, okay? And they'll hurt your garden. You think about that. So here is Solomon. He went by the field of the slothful. You know what a slothful is? Lazy. Don't want to do anything. Don't want to read their Bible. Don't want to pray. Don't want to go to church. <clears throat> oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got God in my heart. They don't want to do anything. They're lazy. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. When you're void of understanding, you, it's because you just won't read your Bible and you won't listen to Bible teaching. <coughs> and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles. Nettles are also little prickly little things. They have stings in them. Nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Are, are you getting this? The thorns... The thorns just came in because no one worked the field and no one, no one wanted to do anything. The thorns just came in and choked it all out. Nobody ever goes by a, a, a vineyard or a field or something like that seeing all of, the, um, all of the thorns and says, Oh, isn't that beautiful? Here in Missouri... We actually have uh, uh, we have a sort of a, a thing uh, that if you have a field in the state of Missouri and you don't work that field every year, you let that field go, and in ten years' time you're going to have cedar trees everywhere in that field. There's a field on the way to my house. I've lived out there for over 20 years. I can remember when I first started driving by it after I first got married. You know, I saw a field out there. And now I notice as I go by, it is completely overgrown with cedar trees. And we used to, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to call them sticker trees. Because you can't hardly climb a cedar tree. It'll, it'll, it'll prick you. It'll sting you as you try to climb it. And that's, that's what happens when you don't tend to the vineyard that God has given you. The thorns come in. We're going to see what these, we're starting to see what these thorns represent. Let's move on. Proverbs chapter 26, 9. Here is, here's where some of you are going to say, you know what, Mike Hoggard, you're crazy. Okay? I want us to just look at the scriptures, shall we? Proverbs 26, verse 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Now, I want you to notice this, that thorns are associated in the Bible with drunkenness. Now, this is not the only example of this. Nahum chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one that come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So let's put all these verses together. We have thorns, and they're associated with drunkenness, and they're associated with the wicked counselor. We know that wicked counselor, according to the Scriptures, is none other than the Antichrist. They, they made a movie. They made a movie about the, uh, about the Antichrist. Okay, uh, it's pretty interesting. But I want you to notice this idea of thorns being associated with drunkenness, being associated with the Antichrist. I want you to think about this. Okay, we're going to see this in a little bit. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 13. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court of... For owls, over and over. In fact, we have a we have a, a sermon on this called uh, "Where Dragons Live," and I did a study of the symbolism of dragons. Okay, and I found out something interesting. Dragons and owls—they're like spirits, and they all uh, they all like to come in in a place where there's really not a lot of life going on. The Bible says they move in where there's a wilderness. A wilderness is untended, unkept ground. And God promises several places in the Bible 
that what he's going to do, because of the disobedience of the children of Israel, the disobedience of his people, God's going to leave, God's going to push them out of the land. And in fact, they're going to be choked out of the land by thorns, by nettles, and the dragons and the owls are going to move in because they love to live in places where there's not a lot of life going on. Are you, are you sort of getting the picture here of what's happening? When there is an absence of our willingness to serve God, when there's an absence, absence of the Word of God, when there is an absence of Jesus Christ Himself, the thorns just sort of come in and take over. Okay? Do you think about that? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3 we're going to kind of get into what we're talking about here. The Bible says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. You know, I love, I, I just love the language and the symbolism of the scriptures. He says, Break up your fallow ground. You know what that means, don't you? That means that when you're ready to plant your garden, when you're ready, to, even if it's just a flower garden or a vineyard, there's, you have to go do something with that ground first because that ground can be hard, stony ground. And, and we know from the parable that Jesus taught that if you throw seed on stony ground, it might come up a little while, but when the heat comes on, there's, it's not going to produce any fruit. It's going to die. And we, we see this. We see this in our lives. We see it in other people's lives. So he says, break up your fallow ground. And I, I love this. The Bible talks about taking a sword. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. I love this. Here is the sword right here. Every now and then as a preacher, every now and then as a preacher, I'll stand behind our pulpit and I'll take this sword and I'll beat it into a plowshare. And while I'm preaching, my intention is to plow up the stony ground of people's hearts. Stony ground inhibits the growth of the Word of God in our life. And I'll tell you this, there, there are times, I've done it before, and, uh, and church people do it. We get into little things in life where we get stubborn against God. We, we get adamant. We get as a stone. And the seed, the Word of God, cannot produce the results that God intends. It will not produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We get adamant over an issue. We get, we get hard-hearted over an issue. We say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I, I believe it's this way. You may have said that before. And what has to happen is, is God has to take this sword and beat it into a plowshare and plow up the fallow, hard, stony ground of your life so that His Word can actually do something in your life. I'm telling you, it's a lot better to have your ground plowed up and to have that good ground, that good soil underneath that crust, that layer of protection that you've got against the Word of God. It's a lot better to have that plowed up. Okay? But then he says, plow up your fallow ground, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Why did he say that? We're going to go back to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to study. Now Jesus is, uh, he's not just speaking the parable. He's giving the interpretation and definition of the parable. He's defining all this, all the symbols that are there. Instead of, instead of telling his disciples, you, you go figure this out. You go, you just go figure it out on your own. And whatever you come up with, that's fine. That, that's not how it is. Jesus was teaching what it means. And he says, verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns. Such as hear the word. And I want you to notice one, two, three things here. Number one, the cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. Number three, the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> is that if, if I were to stand up here and tell you that I never care about anything else in the world but the Bible and Christianity, and uh, I never like to have a dollar bill in my wallet, and I never, ever lust after anything in this world, I would be f as big a liar as anybody who has ever stood behind a pulpit and said that. And there are some who say, I don't lust after things, and I care only about God, and I don't care about... They're lying through their teeth. I'm just telling you the truth about even us preachers. 
is that we like a dollar bill as much as anybody. We get caught up in things of this world that we probably shouldn't, and we definitely lust after other things, whether it's somebody else's wife or somebody else's car or their Rolex or whatever it is. We, all three of these things, not just the preachers, but you too, we have these things in us. We've already got thorns in our field, don't we? It's because we're from Adam. Adam sinned. And in his sin, he passed on his sinfulness to all of us. We're the children of Adam. We're the children of Eve, who the Bible says is mother of all living. We are born after her. And so, therefore, we already have the thorns in us. We already have them. And I can tell you, it takes work. It takes work. The, the times that I plant a garden, I'm amazed I'll go out there with a hoe and I'll hoe them weeds out and I'll work myself to the sweat and I, boy, I feel good after working, you know, and I feel good about myself that I weeded out my garden. And I look out there the next time after it rains and I'm, I'm just flabbergasted because that stuff's already growing back. You, you see how it is? You see, it takes work. And just as Solomon went by the field of the slothful and he looked around, he could tell that no, you can, listen, you can tell that nobody's work in a field. You can tell. We're not judges of other people, but if we can look at someone who says they're a Christian, if we can look at their life and say, you know what, I see a lot of things there that probably shouldn't be there. Don't you think that other people can look at us and see the exact same thing? The cares of this world, getting caught up in wanting to wanting the, the better job, wanting to make more money, wanting to do this, wanting to do that in this world, wanting to build houses, leave a legacy for yourself. That's the cares of this world. And I can tell you that when you care more about the world than you do the word of God, <clears throat> the world is going to come in. The nations that are left behind. They're going to grow up and they're going to choke out every bit of preaching, every bit of Sunday school teaching, every Bible verse you've ever read. They're going to come in and choke it out. And your life does not produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. God does not produce it in your life <clears throat> because the thorns choke it out. Then he talks about the deceitfulness of riches. And I like the way Jesus says this. Did you know money is the biggest liar in the universe? The deceitfulness of riches. You know what that means to me? It means that people think that money can solve all of their problems. I saw a picture the other day of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was the head of Apple corporate Apple computers. Started out with Steve Wozniak in his in his garage and and built I have an iPad. I have an iPad and an iPod. And those are the, the results of, of Steve Jobs. People run around with iPhones everywhere and Mac computers and all this stuff. And, and uh, boy, I tell you what, the guy has made a lot of money in his life. And I saw a picture of him the other day. He resigned as head of the Apple Corporation. I saw a picture of him. He's dying. He's, he's near death. He looks terrible. Money is not solving his problems. Money is not buying his afterlife either. You see, the deceitfulness of riches has choked out whatever word might have ever been sown in his life. It has choked it out. And he'll, when he dies, he will have nothing. And if he does not have the Lord Jesus Christ, he will have nothing forever and forever. So the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, there's three. The lust of other things. Remember the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then all of a sudden, God's cursing with thorns. And here we have the thorns here. The, the lust of other things. Be careful. Be careful. We, we all have a nature in us that sees things that we want. Be careful. Get your plowshare out every now and then and start hoeing up and breaking up some ground and cutting down some thorns in your life. And you say, and you might congratulate yourself. I did. I had revival and I prayed and I, boy, I tell you what, I cleaned house. But you know what? The next thing we know, there they are again. And it takes work and it takes work 
and it takes work. But I want you to notice this number three. We're seeing it consistently throughout the scriptures, this, this number three associated uh, with thorns. And I want you to look what happens. Look what happens now to those who let the thorns take over. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end, oh, look at this, whose end is to be burned. And I want you to notice in this verse that we have, we have blessing and we have cursing. We have blessing when the, when the doctrine of God that distills as the dew, the Bible says, when the doctrines come down upon us and we drink that in and it produces the fruitfulness of our life. Think about the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians. The Bible, that's how the Bible is describing that to us. And we think about the doctrine of God coming down to us as the rain and we drink it in and God is producing the fruitfulness of our lives. That's evidence that we're saved. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. But then there's people who are sitting in churches everywhere who are hearing the word. They're amening. They're glad. But they've got so many thorns in their life and they're not taking care of business. And the thorns come in and they choke it out. And pretty soon, instead of a vineyard, instead of a field, all you have is a bunch of cedar trees. All you have is a bunch of thorns everywhere. And God just says there's a blessing for those who receive the doctrine of the Bible. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. And it's cast into the fire. It's to be burned up. Yeah, you know what that's a you know that you don't need a, 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 a doctor of divinity to understand what fire represents in the Bible, do you? It's cast into the lake of fire forever and forever. It, I'm telling you. It takes work. <clears throat> now I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna bring something else in on this. We, we saw things that, that sting. We, we, we saw the bees and we saw thorns. Notice in Ezekiel chapter two how God associates it again. And thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and though thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Notice this, that, that God is having Ezekiel preach to a people who are going to use words against him. What did the Bible say that the serpent used against Eve? There are some people who have this idea that uh, the serpent, the devil, mated with Eve. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. You know what the Bible says Satan did? He used words on her. And God is saying in Ezekiel chapter 2 that these words are like thorns and briars. And he's dwelling among scorpions. Stop and think about it. We have bees. We have thorns, briars. We have nettles, and they all sting. Uh, the Bible uses the phrase cockles. And when I was a kid running through the woods, we used to get cockle burrs stuck on our pants. They have little stingers on them. They grab a hold of things. We have things and, and scorpions, things that sting. And in some cases, like with bees and scorpions, when they sting, they inject poison. By the way, how does a, how does a serpent get his poison into you? with these little fangs in his mouth that, that pierce and they sting. You see the, how the Bible is relating all of these things together, bees and thorns and, and scorpions and, and nettles and, and serpents, things that, that sting or things that pierce. Think, think about the Scriptures. Think about the symbolism in the Scriptures. And now let's look at things, these, these scorpions. These thorns, these things that sting. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, there's that word as, as the scorpions of the earth have power. 
And I want you to notice in Revelation chapter 9, verse 10, And they had tails like unto scorpions, and their stings were in their tails. Now, let me stop right here because I want you to be thinking now about something in the Bible that has a sting to it and what that sting is, what all these thorns and bees and everything, what they ultimately represent. And by the way, these scorpions, these sting things, they have a king. A king wears a crown. Are you getting where we're going here? Revelation 9-11. I think there's something about September 11th. And I'm going to show you a little bit of it. 9-11. Revelation 9-11. They had a king over them. Which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. He is the king of all stings. Okay, he's the Sting King, I guess you could say it. This, there was a movie called The Scorpion King. It was about him, the king of the scorpions, the king of those who are delivering a sting upon the earth. What does the Bible say that sting represents? Remember what God said. God said, Adam, eat of this tree, thou shalt surely die. And then he cursed the ground with thorns, things that sting. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us what all of this is dealing with. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Look at this now. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin. Why did God curse the ground with, with thorns? Why are there scorpions? Why, are there, why did God say, I'm going to chase you with bees? They're going to, bees are going to surround you. Why is why, all these things, the serpents, they sting. And when they sting, when you get bit by a serpent, what is almost surely going to happen unless you get medical attention? You're going to die. The sting of death. Satan injected his poison, his words, into Eve. It was the sting of death upon her because whereas before she was going to live, now she's going to die. You see how it works now. Think about, think about the king. And, and, and oh, by the way, think of, think of what the devil said to her that was in direct contradiction to what God said. God said, if you eat of this fruit, thou shalt surely die. In other words, the sting is coming. How did the devil get Eve to eat of that fruit? He, he lied to her. Told her something that wasn't true. What did he say? Five words. Thou shalt not surely die. You see, all he did was add one word to what God said. See, see how it changes? Thou shalt not surely die. This number five is always associated in the Bible with death. Genesis chapter 5, you see a pattern of death emerging with the number 5. The law, the law, the five books of the law that Moses wrote, the Bible refers to as the law of sin and death. And the, the strength of sin is the law. And it's all associated with this number 5. And so when we look at, and we talked about this before, the pentagram, the symbol of Lucifer himself, it has five what's on it they look exactly like thorns they look exactly like thorns a, a pentagram you, you know what it is you know what i you know what i see here i see a crown of of thorns is what i see um We've done this before in some of our teaching. We actually counted the number of words that Lucifer spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, starting with, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You shall not surely die. For God doth know the day that ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Exactly 46 words. Now, that matches the number of chromosomes in our, in our cells. In our cells, the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. Okay, literally what makes us up, what what deter by the way, our DNA always brings about death. Every man has died forever. 
Okay, since since this day, every man has died, and that's sort of built into our DNA. See, we already have the thorns built into us. I mentioned that earlier. We already have the sting of death built into us by way of our chromosomes, by way of our own DNA. This is why we need to be redeemed. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, the Bible says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree, notice how he's associating corrupt trees with thorns and thistles. A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, like thorns, is hewn down. And cast into the fire, wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, I had mentioned the 46 uh, words that, that Lucifer spoke uh, to Eve in the Garden of Eden, associated with our chromosomes, our DNA. And I mentioned when we read this earlier, I mentioned about the very words of the Scriptures, how they were used to describe what the soldiers did with Jesus. Now, number one. We have, we have a crown, okay? We have a, a king, something that reigns over, over mankind. We have, uh, we have thorns. We see the symbolism there. But notice in John chapter 19, verse 2, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns. I have been studying the Bible, grew up in church. And I've read that thing I don't know how many times, and I decided to just go look up what the word plat means when they plaited a crown of, you know what it means they braided it wove it together it was a symbol of dna the the coiling the coiling dna the the uh, the ribbon like dna the strands woven together plaited together bra- braided together is what they did it's it's our own it's our own DNA that's ruling over us in our flesh. It's, it's killing us. And it needs, to be, it needs to be crucified. It needs to be killed. Let me, let me throw this in here very quickly. We're talking about Freemasonry and their symbols. And they use this sprig of acacia. And I'll show you how in a little bit. They use the sprig of acacia. And um, they, there's a Masonic emblem where you have a woman. Now, a woman, in all this symbolism, always represents Mystery Babylon the Great. And she is a mother. And in this particular case, this mother is holding a sprig of acacia, or thorns, in her hand. And she is weeping over what Masons call the broken column. Now, the broken column in all the Masonic literature represents the, the god like Osiris or Bacchus or Apollo or any of these other gods who died... And was broken up. And they're awaiting his resurrection. But here's the interesting thing associated with these thorns is that you have Saturn. uh, Father time, they call him, with wings. Saturn is another name for Satan. And you know what he's doing with her hair? He's braiding her hair to make ringlets, to make like DNA. Think about a column that was broken. 9-11, 9-11, September 11th, 2001, 9-11, remember the king of the bottomless pit. There is like three or four different versions of this that I saw after 9-11, and I, and I caught on to the symbolism of it. Remember, we have, we have Mystery Babylon, who is mourning over the broken column with acacia in her hand. And here we have these graphics of the Statue of Liberty, the goddess, with thorns coming. She has a crown of thorns, seven of them. And she is weeping over the broken columns of 9-11. Hmm. Here's what I was going to talk about last week that I, that I, the Lord said, wait, and I'll show it to you. I was dealing with these things, that the issues that come out of the heart of mankind um, and there was a, there's a, I, I've seen a lot of Catholic paintings of Jesus, and they always depict Jesus in various ways, usually with very subtle occult symbolism behind it. I want you to notice this particular Jesus, number one. He has his, has his three fingers 
raised here. Remember what thorns represent. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Um, but it's also as above, so below. We've talked about that in several videos. Uh, things of heaven come, fusing together with things of the earth. As it was in, as it was in the days of Noah, the, uh, the floods came up from the ground and the floods came down from the skies. And that is a picture of what's going to happen. Angels are going to fall from heaven and beasts are going to rise up from the earth. And it's the flood of ungodliness that's going to sweep over planet earth in days that could be coming very, very soon. And we see that image of Baphomet, who is holding, he's got two fingers here, three fingers here, 23, and then he's making the opposite sign here, 23, that's 46, that's our chromosomes, where our DNA is stored, that's where the sting of death is built into us right now. But I want you to notice, uh, we zoom in, and here's, here's this fake Jesus, it's not the real Jesus, it's the Catholic Jesus, who is pointing to his heart, which has flames on it, think about that. And surrounding the heart are thorns. Now remember, Jesus described thorns as being the deceitfulness of riches. We talked about this in last week's Watchmen broadcast about things that deceive. You know what is the biggest deceiver in the world? The heart of man. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart of man is. It's already got the thorns built in. Mark chapter 7, verse 21, Here's what Jesus said about the heart of man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil lie, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. They're in, they're in our hearts. This is, and by the way, there are 13 things here. The York Rite of Freemasonry, we pointed this out. The York Rite of Freemasonry has 13 steps. You just ascend up the ladder and you'll receive this illumination thing or you'll become a, a god like what the serpent promised Eve in the Garden of Eden. But here we have 13 things that are already in our hearts. And you can't say, I don't have none of these, bless God. You've got them. This is why you need to get your plow out every now and then and plow up some ground. Okay? But I want you to notice the symbolism in Revelation chapter 13. The number 13 is associated with the beast. Revelation 13, I saw it stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now I want you to think about this. He's in the heart of of the earth. That's what Jesus that's where Jesus said he was going and he went to preach to spirits that were in prison. So the beast is in the heart of the earth and here is this graphic of Jesus pointing to a heart with thorns in it. G guess guess what this is all about. John said he saw the beast rising up out of the sea and even our own hearts are surrounded by an ocean. It's called the pericardium. It's the sac around our heart. It's filled with salt water, by the way. When they pierced Jesus in the side, that sword pierced his pericardium and his heart. The Bible says blood and water issued forth. We're, we're designed in such a beautiful way. The symbolism is here. And I'm telling you, this beast nature can come out of us. These thorns can come out and choke out every good thing that we want in life that comes from God if we're not really, really, really careful. Let's get into uh, the teachings of Freemasonry very quickly concerning the acacia, concerning the thorns. Here's what Manley Hall said in the secret teachings of all ages. He says, The body of Hiram was buried by the murderers over the brow of Mount Moriah and a sprig of acacia placed upon the grave. Now, let me explain very quickly who Hiram Abiff is. Um, Hiram Abiff in all that now he's mentioned in the Bible, but the Masonic Hiram is all of the gods throughout mythology that were murdered and are awaiting resurrection. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. But here in the Masonic Lodge, they you go through the first three degrees. You with me here? You go through the three degrees of the Blue Lodge. And during this process, a, a play is acted out for you. And actually, you're a participant, participant in the play. You actually become Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff is the guy who knew the secrets. He had the mysteries. And he wouldn't tell anybody. He was the builder of the 
of the temple. The body, I want you to think about that for a minute. And Hiram uh, was murdered by three ruffians, by three men. And the interesting thing is, when you go into Masonic Lodge and you see the reenactment of the murder of, the, of Hiram and Biff, by the way, if you are the initiate, you're Hiram. And they bring you down, and the three ruffians, they, they smite you. And the third time they hit you, they hit you on the head. And you receive a deadly wound in your head. That's what John saw in Revelation 13 concerning the beast. See, we're learning things, aren't we? And you, you receive a, a wound on your head. And in, I'm not making this up. In the Masonic Lodge, you fall backward. And you're, you're murdered. You are the slain God. Remember we said earlier about thorns. Uh, Proverbs talked about thorns and drunkards. Thorns and, and drunkards. They're, they go hand in hand here. Um, when Hiram is murdered, they place thorns over his body. You see a Masonic emblem of a casket with, with acacia on it. That's thorns. That's telling you what this is all about. And, and remember this. That it's equal to drunkenness. And here we have a practice, and, and I, I'm not trying to be anybody's enemy. I'm, I'm not trying to say you're not saved or you're going to have... I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if we're going to be Christians, let's act the way the Bible tells us to act and, and get our learning and our knowledge from the Scriptures rather than from what we saw on television or what we went to church and they were doing at church. There is a difference. There's a practice called slain in the Spirit. You'll not find it in the Scriptures. None of the apostles practiced it. None of the early church did it. Jesus didn't do it. Nobody, nobody in the Bible ever did this thing. In fact, it didn't show up till you know, probably about a hundred or so years ago. Slain in the Spirit. You know how it's done, don't you? They walk up, hit you on the head, you fall backward as dead. In fact, this whole idea of slain in the Spirit, slain means murdered. In what? In your spirit. Spiritually dead. Slain in the Spirit. And they say, well, it's like an act of resurrection. No, that's what baptism is supposed to represent. But not someone hitting you on the forehead and knocking you, and you literally becoming drunk in the Spirit. It is an unbiblical practice. It is the result, watch this, it is the result of people who disregarded the Scriptures, didn't let the doctrine come down as the rain and water their lives, and the thorns came in and started choking the Word out. This is a replacement for true biblical salvation and true spiritual indwelling. That's what it is. Uh, Manley Hall goes on to say concerning the acacia and concerning the thorns and Hiram who is... Uh, Osiris, Nimrod, Bacchus, Tammuz, the Bible talks about him. The chest containing the body of Osiris was washed ashore near Byblos and lodged in the roots of a tamarisk or acacia, which growing into a mighty tree enclosed within its trunk the body of the murdered God. Now remember what we read earlier, that a good tree cannot produce evil fruit or thorns and an evil tree cannot produce Good fruit. You never see apples on a thorn tree. Never. Okay. You never see oranges or grapes on a thorn tree. And so this this idea that the murdered God represents a tree goes right back to the Garden of Eden because there were two trees. One had good fruit. One had bad fruit. One gave life. The other one had the sting of death in it. And that's the one that that Eve chose. He goes on to say, Manly Hall in the Secret Teachings of All Ages, modern Masons should realize the special Masonic significance of the phoenix, for the bird is described as using sprigs of acacia in the manufacture of its nest. We've talked about this phoenix bird before. The phoenix is, and here we get into Bible symbolism. Remember, Remember when the seed is thrown out there, what happens? The, the birds, the fowls of the air with their wings fly down and they gobble it up so it doesn't ever uh, uh, take root. And, and the Bible describes those fouled creatures with wings as the devil and, and his devils. Think about it. So here we have a mythological 
bird, a fowl, a spirit. Okay? And it's called the phoenix. And the phoenix builds a nest. It, it lives in thorns. And the phoenix uh, is going to die, is dead, and is going to be resurrected every 500 years, the myth goes. Incidentally, it's the fifth angel that sounds and releases the king of the bottomless pit, who is the phoenix. And uh, these scorpions come out and sting men for five months. That's why you have the 500-year cycle in the myth. It all goes back to the scriptures. But anyway, you have the phoenix bird that is cast into the fire. What, what, think about the fire. Now, in Revelation chapter 9, we have the releasing of the Antichrist out of the pit. It's interesting to note when we look in Revelation chapter 8, verses 7 through 10, we have, uh, we have a lot of things that are on fire and that result in the angel coming down and releasing uh, those that are in the bottomless pit. Uh, you have Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded. There followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Verse 8, the second angel sounded. As it were, a great mound and burning with fire. Verse 9, the third part of the creatures were in the sea. It had life and died. Uh, verse 10, the third angel sounded. There fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. You have all of this fire and burning going on. And then you have the releasing the releasing, you have all of this fire and burning going on, and then you have the releasing of the angel of the bottomless pit, Revelation 9, 11. That's who the phoenix is, and he builds his nest in the thorns. Think about your life, okay? So anyway, um, now, in the Bible, the word... Acacia that is not found in the scriptures. It is, however, the word Shittim or Shitta. That was the word, that's like from an old Hebrew word, that was the word describing the trees and the thorns of the trees. And here is something that is, remember what I've said, we've got all this stuff and we've already got the thorns in us, right? Okay, we've already got, you know, the, the cares of this world and the lust of other things and the deceitful, we have already got that in us. Here's the interesting thing. God's so wise in what he does. Primarily, when you find the word shittim or shitta tree in the scriptures, of course, it's the thorn tree. Practically everything in the tabernacle in the wilderness. Remember what, our, what the tabernacle is? It's this body right here. Practically everything in the tabernacle was, that had wood in it, it was acacia wood or shittim wood, thorns. This earthly house, uh, this tabernacle right here, is full of thorns. And remember, the tabernacle itself had 20 boards down one side, 20 boards down the other, and six boards across the back. 46, the number of chromosomes. We've already got it in us. And this tabernacle needs to be dissolved. And the interesting thing, I like this now. Here's where we're going to get good, and we're almost done. <clears throat> the crown of thorns, the acacia, the word shittim or shitta in, this, in the King James Bible. It's mentioned exactly 33 times. 33 times in the King James Bible this word is used to describe the tree that bears the thorns. Think of the one who... The tree who was the tree of life, and yet he had done nothing wrong, and he had never disobeyed God one time, and yet he took upon himself the curse. That's what that, that's what that crown of thorns represented on, on... That's what that crown of thorns represented on Jesus Christ. Number one, it denotes a king. We saw who that king was, Revelation 9-11, it's the king of the bottomless pit, the phoenix that's going to rise again one of these days. The thorns, it represents the curse, and it represents the specific curse that reigns over every man. It is the curse of death. The Bible says, for it is appointed unto man once to die. We all are going to see death. And the Bible says, Christ tasted death for every man. But he took, because mankind is sinful, 
Because we are appointed to death, God had a way of redeeming mankind. It was through the man, Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the crown of thorns. Think about this. The Bible talks about Samson. Those that ruled over him were the five lords of the Philistines. There's that number five again, the number for death. And here we have the five lords of the Philistines who are not just reigning over Samson. They're like literally over him because they're sitting up on the top of the temple of Dagon. And here is Samson underneath. And he says, let me die with the Philistines. He brings them down. The Bible says he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. I love the language in the scriptures and the, and, and the symbolism of the scriptures of the King James Bible. Because here is Jesus who took upon himself the crown of the scourge in his sides, the, the thorns in his eyes, literally that crown of thorns. He took that upon himself and he took the king, the one who had power over death, upon himself and killed his enemies in his death. I think that is absolutely interesting. The interesting, and here's something else that goes along with this. The Bible says this phrase, the beast, the beast. In the, in the New Testament of the King James Bible, mentioned exactly 33 times. And I mentioned earlier a movie. A movie about the birth and the coming of the Antichrist. It was actually made in the early 70s and a remake came out this century. It's called The Omen. And it features the birth and the growing of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the king of of the bottomless pit, whose father was the devil himself. His name was Damien. His last name was Thorn. Jesus defeated the power of the beast, the power of the the power of sin, and the curse of the thorns, which is the sting of death. Jesus defeated every one of those by taking them on to himself in his sacrificial death. For us, he tasted death for every man so that you and I might live. The Bible says it this way in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, you are already dead, the Bible says. We already have death reigning over us, the scriptures say. We already have death reigning over us. We're already dead in sins and in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of our flesh, hath he quickened together. The word quickened means to be made alive. Uh, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Remember, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. The law is actually, even though it's written for our good, it is against us because all of us have broken the law. And so the Bible says that Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The, the sting of death literally was taken to the cross. Notice this. Having spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You know what the Bible's telling us? That when Jesus was on the cross, he was showing our enemies, our curses. They had scourged him. They had cursed him. They had mocked him. They, they put a plat. They had platted or braided a crown of thorns. Death. Uh, our death reigning over us. And they had put that on him. And they smote him with it. They smote him in the head. Remember the beast has a deadly wound in his head. Goliath had a wound in his head. And Jesus took all of that and he made a show of his enemies openly on the cross he showed every enemy that you and i have and the last enemy that we have which shall be destroyed the bible says is death and jesus destroyed our curse our sins and the power of death over us he destroyed that 
on his cross, nailing them all to his cross so that when he died, death died with him. I love the Bible. I love the fact that even though there are mysterious things in the Bible, things that when we read them, we go, what is that? I love the fact that the Bible will explain better than any man, better than I've done, will explain the symbols and the pictures and the shadows and the ensamples and the allegories. The Bible will not keep them hidden from us, but will explain them all in such beautiful detail so that you and I have understanding. If you get anything out of this video, get this. Number one, you were born a sinner. You didn't just learn how to sin by hanging out with a bad crowd. You were born a sinner. The thorns are dwelling in you, literally in your DNA right now. You have sin in you. You have evil things in your heart that you cannot make go away. You ever wanted to have a better life? You ever wanted to live better? You ever wanted to do things that were right? And yet you just couldn't find a way to do it. Did you ever wonder, how is it that I can escape hell? Through the power of the cross, Jesus already died wearing that crown of thorns. You see, he was just showing you. I've taken everything. I've taken the, the piercing. I've taken the, um, the, the sting of death itself upon myself. So that you might live. Ask Jesus into your heart. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Shall be saved. Believe him. And I hope I've taught you in this time. That you can believe. His word. It's such an amazing book. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. May God truly bless you. We'll see you the next time. Bye bye.